Hello and welcome back to my channel, Fanfic Fantasy. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off the first part of our series, What If Tanjiro Was Upper Moon's Apprentice? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is SM0LB3TCH from Wattpad. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Kokushibo stared at the unconscious human boy. He wasn't dead, yet, but was close. He definitely knew that no matter how much he tried he couldn't win against an upper moon all alone. However, he still fought. The boy also had noticed him even when he was in his human disguise. He had walked past Kokushibo and glanced at him, with a very calm expression. But Kokushibo knew that the boy was suspicious. He had great potential. The boy hadn't unlocked his true potential yet, and it'd be a shame if he never got the chance to. The only way he would've gotten the chance as a human would've been a lot of training. However, his time had been cut short. Even if he had had the time, he could've never reached the peak of his strength. He would have always be held back by his mortal body. Kokushibo turned to look at the demon girl who had fought alongside with the human. She was stuck under some rubble and was trying her hardest to get out. Kokushibo heard from Musen that one demon had managed to escape his grasp, just like Tameo had. This girl must be it. Well better not let her live. Kokushibo sliced the demon girl with his sword and she started disintegrating. One less problem to deal with. Kokushibo went a little closer to the demon slayer. The boy reminded Kokushibo of a certain someone. Yoriichi. Those earrings. That scar. Suddenly, the boy's eyelids twitched. Even with his arm missing, leg twisted in an awkward and uncomfortable position. Majority of his bones broken. Deep wounds that continued to bleed, probably inner organ damage and dislocated joints. He still was able to pull himself back to consciousness. So he still tries to fight. The demon slayer's eyes opened and immediately fell onto Kokushibo, then to the demon girl's kimono that had been left to the ground after she died. The boy most likely he knew what had happened to her as he started crying. The Nezuko. The boy muttered as he sobbed. No more waiting. Kokushibo was now right next to the boy and he knew exactly what Kokushibo had in mind. The boy backed away the best he could while coughing up blood. He even tried to throw his sword at Kokushibo. But that attempt was sad as Kokushibo simply dodged it without even trying. Since stay away the boy coughed out. Kokushibo stabbed his katana through the boy's torso to keep him pinned to the ground. He coughed even more blood and slightly screamed. The boy coughed, gasped, panted, tried and tried to get some air in his lungs to at least stop the bleeding. His lungs were definitely half destroyed. He was stubborn. He just refused to give up. Great potential indeed. Stay still. You'll only damage your body even more. The response Kokushibo got was a pathetic cough for air. Become a demon and unlock your true power. The boy slowly raised his arm that hadn't been cut off and tried to grab Kokushibo's blade, still piercing his side. He managed to grab it but wasn't able to pull it out. He had no strength left in his body. While the boy was struggling against Kokushibo's sword, Kokushibo had already cut his hand. Once the boy realized that his expression changed from scared to absolutely terrified. And then no the boy coughed. Pee please please no. That was all the boy could do before the blood was already pouring down his throat. The boy coughed, wheezed, gasped. He tried everything to spit the blood out. He tried turning his head to the side so the blood would simply be affected by gravity and not go down his throat. But that was simply fixed by Kokushibo holding his head in place. The boy screamed in agony. It definitely hurt. The transformation always hurt. His eyes were unfocused and he probably broke his jaw by accident. Kokushibo awkwardly petted the boy's head as if trying to soothe the pain. He had no idea why, he just did. The human boy's nails started to grow longer and sharper, forming claws. They turned into more of a black color as they did. A pair of sharp fangs grew in place for his human teeth and his pupils became slitted. The sclere of his eyes turned into a dark red color, reminding a bit of blood. At first Kokushibo had thought his eyes had started bleeding. The boy's eyes started glowing slightly as they became brighter. His scar extended from the top of his forehead to his nose and another one appeared from his neck and reached his cheek. His forehead started to bleed from the middle and a new eye appeared. Another eye appeared on the opposite side of his face on his cheek. His arm slowly grew back and his wounds started to heal. The transformation was completed. The boy was now a demon. Kokushibo removed his sword from the boy's side and the wound healed. His other arm was also almost completely healed. 
The boy had stopped screaming and was now gasping for air. He slowly blinked back to reality and realized what had happened. He slowly sat up and looked at his hands, his missing one now fully healed. He started to cry. The boy began to cry. The boy hid his face in his arms. Kokushibo could hear him mutter no no no. As he sobbed into his hands, the boy still had his memories. If Kokushibo wanted for the boy to fully embrace his power, the boy needed to forget about his human life. There was two options. The boy had to eat a human, or the boy received more blood. And so conveniently, a human appeared. Go and feed. Otherwise you can't grow to your full strength. The boy shook his head and continued to sob. And no, let go of your human life. It'll only hold you back. And no, the human obviously tried to run away after seeing Kokushibo's extra eyes. But that attempt was cut short by a quick slash of Kokushibo's blade. The blood bleeding out from the corpse must have smelled delicious to the newly turned demon as he froze. He was still holding himself back. Go on. Devour the human. Satisfy your hunger. Grow stronger. Kokushibo could see that the boy was drooling. He was also breathing through his nose, which was a little odd at first until Kokushibo understood. The boy had a great sense of smell, and when a human turns into a demon their senses get stronger. This boy's sense of smell must have been as great as a demon's while he was a human, if not even greater. And now that he is a demon the smell of blood must be must be stronger than he was used to. The smell is driving him insane. In an instant Kokushibo had brought the dead human next to the newborn demon. It was obviously too much for the starving demon as the second the corpse was next to him, he had bounced on it and started to devour it like a wild beast. The sound of flesh being ripped from bones and the sound of blood pouring everywhere was accompanied by the sound of the newborn demon grinding the meat in his mouth. Nothing else was heard. It was dead silent. Kokushibo stayed still and quiet, observing the boy lose himself in the bloodlust. Soon the boy seemed to finish, and he slowly sat up next to the corpse, or what was left of it, and stared. He stared at the corpse with an empty gaze. The lower half of his face was covered in crimson blood and so were his hands. It was clear, the boy still could remember his human life, but it seemed like his brain was slowly locking away those memories. He slowly turned his head to look at Kokushibo. What? What happened? The boy muttered. You turned into a demon. Demon. The boy repeated. After Kokushibo had nodded he started crying again. This time he wasn't crying loudly, more like the tears were just spilling from his eyes and he had no idea how to stop them. He wasn't moving or making a sound. He sat still as the salty tears poured down his face and fell to his lap. Kokushibo awkwardly reached out and placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. Let go of your humanity and embrace your true power. As the corpse next to them continued to bleed and the tears from the boy's eyes continued to spill, the boy's eyes slowly lose the bright and determined gleam and his memories fade away to the darkness. Whoever he used to be is no more. Whoever used to be his friends and family are strangers to him. Whatever he used to do is useless. Whoever he trusted and loved is gone from his life. Now he's a demon, and this man next to him is his mentor. Nezuko was dead. His only family left was dead. The one he promised to help was dead. His sister who he promised to turn back into a human was dead. And now he had become a demon. He was nothing like Nezuko. When the upper moon had brought the human body closer he had completely lost himself. He had devoured that poor human like a monster. Like a wild beast. He was a monster. He was a horrible person. That's right, a voice said. Tanjiro couldn't recognize who the owner of the voice was. It kinda sounded like his own, but at the same time it sounded like someone else. Why did you deserve to live? The voice asked. This time it kinda sounded like his mother. You promised you'd turn me back. You're useless. Can't you do one single thing right? You're weak. Look what have you become. You could've at least tried harder. Why didn't you help us? You promised you'd kill him. Why didn't you train more? What would Rengoku-san think? You're a disgrace. Monster. You promised you'd come back. You killed me. Horrible. I am disappointed in you. Demon. Drop dead. Every time the voice spoke it sounded a bit different. There was always a small part of it that sounded like himself, and another part that sounded like the people he had met. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I quote him sorry. He was a demon. A man-eating demon. A monster that devour humans just to satisfy their own hunger and gain power. He failed. He failed to save Nezuko. He disappointed everyone. He was a horrible person. As Tanjiro continued to cry the voices slowly faded away, and he stopped crying after the last voice was gone. Why was he crying again? He should be training right now. He should be training with his sensei. He sold be getting stronger. He sold and be crying. Who was Nezuko? Was that even the name he had remembered? 
Probably not. He shouldn't be thinking about things like this. Tanjiru's crow, Matsuman, cried while flying towards the Yubayashiki estate to report. The red-haired boy and the demon girl had quite grown onto him. The demon girl, despite being a demon, seemed to be quite intrigued by the talking crow. There were rare moments when the demon girl had gotten close enough to touch Matsuman's black feathers. Sometimes he'd fly away from the demon, sometimes he'd stay. On those occasions he did stay it usually ended up with Matsuman curled up in her long curly hair, or wrapped in her black haori. The demon girl was surprisingly gentle with the loud crow. Tanjiru was no different. Despite many finding him annoying, Tanjiru didn't. Tanjiru didn't care if Matsuman screamed at the top of his lungs. Yeah, he'd say that he already heard the mission and no need to shout it, but he never got angry. Sometimes Tanjiru would give Matsuman some of his food. Sometimes he'd pet Matsuman's feathers while talking with his two friends. But now, Nezuko was dead and Tanjiru remembered nothing. Matsuman felt guilty. He had been the one to inform Tanjiru about the mission. If he hadn't, then maybe Nezuko would be alive and Tanjiru still a human. No no no, Tanjiru wouldn't want him thinking like that. He wouldn't want him to blame himself. Tanjiru would want him to do what's right. The right thing to do right now was to complete his job. Matsuman landed quietly onto the tatami floor in front of Oyakata-sama and Amain-sama. Nezuko Kamado had been killed by Upper Moon One and Tanjiru Kamado has been turned into a demon by Upper Moon One. Matsuman informed. Oyakata-sama's smile didn't waver, it only took more of a sadder form. Is Tanjiru still alive? Matsuman lowered his head. Possibly. Upper Moon One took him soon after the transformation. Oyakata-sama nodded his head softly, his eyes holding a sad gaze. Tears started to spill from Matsuman's eyes once again as he was dismissed. His next objective was to inform other crows about Tanjiru's and Nezuko's fate, and then inform their friends. He flew from crow to crow, telling what had happened to the poor siblings and continuing on his job. Eventually he reached the Butterfly Mansion, where he was ordered to tell Inasuke and Zenitsu, who were recovering from their last missions. For the first time, these two were completely quiet. Zenitsu obviously looked like he was ready to cry waterfalls and Inasuke. He only stared at the crow with his eyes widened under his mask. Kano had stopped smiling. Naho, Sumi and Kyo were already crying. Ai had dropped the laundry basket from her hands. Then Zenitsu bursted into tears. Tanjiro was turned into a demon. Ai muttered as tears began to form in her eyes. No one said anything else. Kano stayed silent while looking at the ground and thinking about the few meaningful memories she and Tanjiro made. Naho, Sumi, Kyo and Zenitsu were all crying their eyes out and Ai was ready to join them. Inasuke had started trembling, tears prickling in his eyes. Then he yelled, Shut up. Monjiro wouldn't want you to cry like a crybaby. Shut up. Remember what he told us. He yelled right at Zenitsu while crying as well. Inasuke, Zenitsu, if something ever happens to me, I want you to not cry over me. If I die on a mission or if I get turned into a demon, I want you to train and become stronger. That way you will be able to defeat me. That way my soul will be able to train with you guys as well. I want you to continue on living without me. Don't cry over me, okay? Become stronger for me, alright. That's right. Tanjiru wouldn't want them crying their eyes out over him. He'd want them to continue on, even if he can't be with them. He'd be upset if his death or demonification would hold them down. He'd be sad if all they did would do was cry. He wants them to grow stronger. He wants them to smile. There's no point in crying. Crying will do nothing. They needed to train harder so they could be strong enough to behead Tanjiru. They needed to be stronger so they could kill Tanjiru and bring peace to him. Tanjiru wouldn't be mad at them, they knew that. He'd accept his fate in hell and atone for his sins. They knew that once they'd defeat Tanjiru, he'd only smile warmly at them and thank them. Kokushibo sat silently as Tanjiru ripped the human's arm off and began munching on it. The boy was a very odd demon. After he had stopped crying, he seemed like an empty shell. He did everything he was told and he asked no questions. It seemed like they boy thought he didn't have any purpose anymore. Like the only thing he could do right now was to obey every single order given. Tanjiru fiddled with a bone from the arm he had finished eating. His eyes were empty, foggy. They didn't hold the bright light they used to. Same with his other two eyes. They're empty, dull. They held no emotion, unlike before. Kokushibo hadn't quite expected for Tanjiru's demon form to take on a such similar form to Kokushibo's. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that Kokushibo had been the one to turn him. Kokushibo wasn't sure. Kokushibo had tested Tanjiru's blood demon art earlier when capturing the human he was eating. From Kokushibo's perspective, the situation looked a bit odd. The human had abruptly stopped and looked right ahead of him. Then the human had started crying with a smile. For a moment the human seemed to be talking with himself until Tanjiru had killed him. 
Tanjiru, explain your blood demon dot 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 art dot 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 how does it work? Tanjiru looked up from the human's head he was poking with the arm bone and looked at Kokushibo. I think it creates an illusion. Makes the victim think they're seeing something they really want. Tanjiru explained. I think this one saw a dead relative. Tanjiru guessed and pointed at the half-eaten corpse. I see. So Tanjiru's blood demon art basically creates an illusion in the human's head. Distracting the human and giving time for Tanjiru to go for the kill. A very useful blood demon art. It doesn't allow for Tanjiru to gain a powerful weapon like Kokushibo, and it doesn't allow for some kind of special attack with a super deadly effect on the human. It confuses the human, weakening them, tricking them and making them oblivious to the threat. It plays tricks with the human mind. It uses the mental weakness human minds possess as a weapon against the human. Someone once said that you are your own worst enemy. Guess whoever that was, was kinder right. A group of Kakushis followed Matsuman back to Tanjiru's and Nezuko's last battlefield. Dodu was one of those. This place is a mess. The buildings nearby were completely smashed and destroyed. The trees were cut down in multi-points and only a few of them still stood up, hanging on for dear life. There was blood spilled in a dead body. The body was probably someone unfortunate who was killed because they happened to walk by. The Kakushis buried the body before beginning to look for anything that was left of the Kamado siblings. Nezuko's clothes were found stuck under a building that had fallen. She must have gotten trapped and was killed then. Poor Nezuko. The only remains of Tanjiru was his sword and his arm, alongside a piece of his Hayori that had been cut with the hand. Nothing else remained. The Kakushis were sent there to retrieve their remains so they could be buried. Many had mixed feelings about the funeral. Nezuko was a demon and many core members weren't really on board with the idea of a demon getting buried alongside demon slayers. And Tanjiru had been turned into a demon so, many, mostly the ones who didn't like the idea of Nezuko being buried, had the opinion of Tanjiru not also deserving a funeral. Regardless of the opinions and objections, the funeral was held. Tanjiru and Nezuko were buried right next to each other. Everything was dark. Nezuko couldn't see a thing. The last thing she had felt was a sharp and quick cut through her neck and then another one cutting her in half. Her mind was empty, foggy, but now that she didn't feel the burning pain anymore, it was getting more clearer now. She was Nezuko Kamado. Her family used to live up in the mountains, until one night Musen Kibitsuji had slaughtered them, turning Nezuko into a demon. Her older brother, Tanjiru, had done everything in his power to turn her back into a human. But it wasn't enough. They had encountered Upper Moon One, who was the one that had killed Nezuko. Tanjiru hadn't gotten that fate. He had been turned into a demon. Why? Why did he have to suffer? He had suffered so much already. Gods, why? Why? Nezuko. Nezuko raised her head to look at her mother. Mom. Nezuko muttered, tears in her eyes. Nisan. Nisan is here. Nisan can you play with me? Calm down you three. Mom. Hinako. Shidru. Rokuda. Takeyo. Nezuko began to cry. A soft and gentle chuckle was heard from Nezuko's side. Dad, Nisan, were Nai-chan. Shidru's question made Nezuko burst into tears. And Nisan, idiot. Takeo smacked Shidru's head slightly. Ouch. Tenjiro and Kai gently hugged Nezuko. And Nai-chan was turned into a demon. Nezuko cried. The younger Kamados joined the hug as Nezuko's sobs grew louder. Welcome home. Interesting. Interesting indeed. Kokushibo had turned a demon slayer who was being a pain in the ass to a demon. The demon slayer who had confronted Musen. Last time Musen saw the boy he was yelling at him with his face full of rage. But now, as Musen stared at the small demon next to Kokushibo, the boy was like an exact opposite of himself. There was no sign of any type of emotion shown on his face. The boy stared with empty eyes that seemed to never blink. If he'd be lying on the ground the only way to tell if he was alive was the steady rise and fall of his chest as he breathed. If not for the fact that when demons die they disintegrate. One quick glance at the boy's mind revealed the reason quite easily. After losing his pathetic traitor sister and turning into a demon the boy couldn't handle the grief, and his brain blocked every single memory. Being a demon also helped with that. Now he was like an empty shell, a useless tool unless it's given something to do. The boy did everything he was told. He asked no questions. Still, Musen couldn't ignore how Kokushibo had done something like this without Musen premission. Oh well, seeing the demon boy wear the earrings that man wore was a perfect insult to the monster. And besides, lately many of his demons have started to fall because they're too cocky of their own power. They go on their way to challenge a Hashira and die in the next four seconds. A demon who really doesn't have any self-worth and only has the purpose to do every single task given. That's a demon Musen doesn't create every single night. I will forgive you this time, Musen eventually says. Make him useful and I won't kill him. 
Dismissed. We'll need to get you some new clothes, Kokushibo said. Tanjiro looked at the clothing he was wearing. It was covered in blood and dirt. The part of his left arm was completely missing, showing his pale skin. The clothing looked like an uniform. Tanjiro wasn't sure. It looked too odd to be normal clothing. On top of his black uniform was a green and black checkered Hayori. The Hayori was also covered in soil and blood. The Hayori was quite torn. It was quite a surprise it still held on to Tanjiro's small figure. The uniform was quite uncomfortable because of the blood. The blood made the fabric tacky and it clung onto Tanjiro's skin, making him feel itchy. Since Tanjiro was still getting used to his demonic abilities, Kokushibo had basically carried the boy while he ran. Kokushibo ran to the nearest village and soon found a house where someone Tanjiro's age lived. Kokushibo looked through the closets as Tanjiro devoured the humans who lived there. Eventually Kokushibo found something that wouldn't restrict Tanjiro's fighting. Kokushibo handed the clothes to Tanjiro and told him to change into them. Before he left to give the boy some privacy, Kokushibo noticed that Tanjiro had began to take his earrings off. Keep them, Yuzen wanted to see the demon boy wear the earrings of him. The perfect insult he said. Tanjiro asked no questions and left the earrings. Soon the boy joined Kokushibo outside of the house, now changed into the more cleaner and comfortable clothing. Is it more comfortable? Tanjiro nodded. Good. We'll need to find a sword for you. A sword, your own, was left behind. Tanjiro said nothing else, simply trailing behind Kokushibo as they walked. Tanjiro panted as he swung his sword. During training he wasn't allowed to use his blood demon art, not that it would have any effect on demons, so he had to rely on his pure strength. However, holding a sword left nostalgic. Your own sword was left behind, right? Kokushibo had mentioned that he had a sword once. Why did he own one in the first place? A. It didn't matter enough for Tanjiro to care. His training was more important. Train. Get stronger. Don't disappoint. Don't disappoint. Don't you ever dare to disappoint him. Kokushibo's voice was heard. He has decided to let you live. Tanjiro nodded as sweat drops fell to the floor and he regenerated, healing his wounds and regrowing his arm. Yuzen had been kind enough to allow for Tanjiro to live, under the circumstances that Tanjiro would be useful and not be a disappointment. Disappointment. The word rang in Tanjiro's mind. I'm a disappointment. I'm useless. Be useful. Do everything you're told to. I can't do anything right. Try again. Be stronger. Push yourself to your limits. Train harder. Don't. Ever. Disappoint. Him. The more stronger Tanjiro grew, the more he seemed to change. His appearance didn't gance at all. He still looked like a mini version of Kokushibo, just with one pair of eyes less and having more of a reddish color palette. His personality did have some changes. Kokushibo didn't know what kind of person Tanjiro was when he was a human, but if he had to take a wild guess, he'd say Tanjiro was a determined and bright kid, based off of their first encounter. After turning into a demon he was very quiet. He rarely spoke and his face was always in a calm and empty gaze. Dama, who had somehow catched a glimpse of Tanjiro, had pointed out that it made Tanjiro seem even more like a tiny version of Kokushibo. Now that he was growing stronger, Tanjiro was slowly getting the brightness back. It started with a sudden small smile when Kokushibo had pointed out that he was getting stronger, then widened eyes, shining with curiosity and amazement, as he observed Kokushibo practice his own skills. He seemed to enjoy watch Kokushibo perform his moon-breathing techniques. It looks pretty, Tanjiro had said. I like watching the moon swirl. While Tanjiro still did everything he was told and rarely asked questions, he was getting quite curious of the world around. It did take some time before Tanjiro asked the first question. Why doesn't the moonlight kill us? Kokushibo tilted his head slightly at Tanjiro's question. Sunlight kills us, and if the moonlight is reflected sunlight, why doesn't the moonlight kill us as well? Kokushibo pondered before answering. The moonlight isn't strong enough to burn us. When the sunlight gets reflected from the moon, it's much more weaker and unable to harm us. At least that seemed the most logical explanation. The clouds weaken the sunlight as well. Tanjiro gazed at Kokushibo, his four eyes shining dimly. Tanjiro indeed was a quite curious demon. He was not only curious about the world they lived in, but also curious about the other upper moons. Sometimes Kokushibo would have another Kazuki member watch over the red-haired demon as he spoke with Muzan. One time when Nakaim had been watching over Tanjiro, Tanjiro had gotten curious about her appearance and blood demon art. You hide your eyes. Tanjiro had pointed out after a bit of silence. I hide my eye. Nakaim had said. 
You have one eye. Nakaim nodded, expecting Tanjiro to say something insulting. Can I see it? Slowly, Nakaim moved her black hair out of the way, showing her bright pink eye underneath. Pretty. Tanjiro mumbled out. Tanjiro's comment startled Nakaim. It looks pretty. When Kokushibo had returned, Tanjiro was sitting on his knees in front of Nakaim. There were multiple small braids in Nakaim's long silky hair, and her eye was showing. Her lips had twisted into a soft smile as she combed through Tanjiro's red hair. When Kokushibo and Tanjiro turned to leave Nakaim had waved back to Tanjiro. Nakaim was pretty much the only one Kokushibo trusted enough to watch over Tanjiro. He didn't trust Dauma one bit and Akaza refused to babysit a demon instead of going out training or hunting. The other upper moons were rarely summoned to the Infinity Castle. And besides, Nakaim clearly seemed to enjoy Tanjiro's company. Maybe that's why she just didn't summon someone else to watch over Tanjiro. Tanjiro hopped from rooftop to rooftop. Kokushibo had allowed him to go explore while he did some errands nearby. Kokushibo knew that Tanjiro would be able to kill a demon slayer, or two if needed so he trusted that the boy wouldn't get himself killed. The place smelled weird that's for sure. Tanjiro didn't like the smell but was intrigued by the bright lights and colors the place had. Weird how this place is so full of life even though it's the middle of the night. Tanjiro taught briefly as he eventually settled on a rooftop and watched the lively streets. Tanjiro dangled his legs slightly off of the roof and swung them softly, his hakama pants swaying ever so slightly in the soft wind. Then suddenly Tanjiro felt a presence. Hey, what are you doing up on the rooftop? A feminine voice asked. Tanjiro turned his head to look at a woman with black hair. In her eyes was the kanji for Upper Six, so she was Upper Moon Six. She looked visibly surprised to see Tanjiro's face. Had she not felt Tanjiro's demonic presence? That's good then. Kokushibo had instructed Tanjiro to work on masking his demonic presence as much as possible. You're a demon. Tanjiro nodded. Then what are you doing in my territory? You should know to not wander in here, brat. She moved to grab Tanjiro by his ear and lifted him up easily. Tanjiro's ear began to bleed as it was slowly being ripped from his head. How come you look so familiar? She muttered. Tanjiro didn't say anything. He kept quiet because the next second the woman's hand was cut off and Tanjiro fell back to the roof. Huh? She let out a quiet and questioning noise. Then she turned to look at the demon boy, only to find him gone. She looked around frantically and saw him standing next to someone. Upper Moon 1. The woman immediately fell to her knees and bowed down, pressing her forehead onto the roof tiles. Disrespecting Upper Moon 1 was basically the same as disrespecting Musen Sama. Tanjiro healed his ear in no time and once again stared at the streets, curiosity shining in his eyes. F-O forgive me Kokushibo Dono. I I didn't know he was. Before you, say anything. He is not my son, even if he does look like me. He is my apprentice, Kokushibo said, knowing Daki would assume Tanjiro to be his son because of the resemblance, like Dauma had. Tanjiro paid no attention to Kokushibo's words and annoyed a human by closing the window every time they opened it. All right, Kokushibo turned to look at Tanjiro. The boy now had found an arm somewhere and was eating it. Daki visibly wanted to make up for the mistake she made. I if why you wish, I see can go buy us something for him. She stuttered, fearing that one wrong movement could kill her. Kokushibo glanced at Daki, who was still bowing but not pressing her head through the roof. Then he turned to back to Tanjiro. Is there something you want? Tanjiro wiped the blood off of face and nibbled on a finger bone. Crushing the bone and swallowing the crushed bone, Tanjiro eventually spoke. A hairdy, please. His hair had grown a bit and while training it got a bit annoying. Kokushibo turned to look at Daki who nodded quickly and stood up, jumping off somewhere, probably to change into her human dig eyes. Several minutes later she came back with a small decorated pouch. She handed the pouch to Tanjiro, who had been standing on his palms because of boredom. Tanjiro opened the pouch and inside it was a bright red hairdy that had some small decorative charms tied to it. Tanjiro tied his hair with the hairdy, unintentionally mimicking Kokushibo's hairstyle. Tanjiro, let's go. You need to train. Tanjiro stood up and moments later, the two had ran off. To Daki it looked like they had disappeared into thin air. Daki exhaled. That had been one of the scariest moments in her life. She should have noticed the resemblance sooner. I summoned Upper Moon One here first. Even now he's listening to us. Nakaim said. Akaza turned around where he felt Kokushibo's presence and there the man was, sitting on his knees quietly as a smaller demon sat next to him. Tanjiro was the demon's name. He had been taken by Upper Moon One to be his apprentice some time ago. Nobody except Musen, Nakaim, and Kokushibo himself knew when he had been turned. Even Tanjiro couldn't remember. His memories started out as a valley full of fog, where he couldn't see anything. He couldn't recall when exactly he turned. 
If someone asked him, he'd most likely say that he's always been a demon. And what did it matter for how long he's been a demon? It didn't matter if he was turned 10 years ago or few months ago. The boy in question was looking out of the window into the depths of the Infinity Castle. I have been here the whole time. Musen Sama has arrived. The rest of the Upper Moon stared at Tanjiru, and Tanjiru stared back with slight curiosity. He had never seen the other Kazukis up close, and Nakaim technically wasn't an Upper Moon. Akaza, who recognized the boy was obviously pissed off, but found it hilarious that Tanjiru, the one who had been yelling at him about humans being weaker than demons but still winning in the end no matter what, was now a demon himself. Nikokushibo Dono, you never really introduced him to us. Dauma said, he is my apprentice. There is nothing else that matters. Tanjiru had shifted his attention to Jayako's strange appearance. The odd, far from anything humanoid, appearance of the upper moon intrigued Tanjiru. Tanjiru wanted to get a closer look, but didn't leave Kokushibo's side, simply staring at Jayako from across the platform. Jayako obviously noticed this. Hayo, he seems to have a sense of style. I see he has taken interest in my beautiful appearance and my wonderful pot. Jayako praised himself, then appearing from another pot that was closer to Tanjiru, and patted the boy's head. He is curious, Kokushibo said. Anything that looks odd or unusual to him, he wants to see closer. Jayako wasn't sure if he should feel insulted or not. The demon boy wasn't intrigued by his appearance because he looked amazing, but he looked odd. The boy was interested, yes, but because he looked odd. As Jayako kept thinking about Kokushibo's words, Tanjiru had reached up and pulled one of Jayako's hands. Jayako let out a small shriek as a very slight pain stung in the arm as the small demon pulled. Kokushibo reached to grab Tanjiru's wrist. Tanjiru, let go. Tanjiru stayed quiet as he loosened his grip on Jayako's hand and let go. Jayako appeared more far away from the boy and glared at him. Tanjiru stared at Jayako for a moment then glanced at Hantingu, who hid behind a wall when Tanjiru looked at him. Then Tanjiru looked at the two upper moons near Kokushibo, one with pink hair and blue tattoos all over him and one with rainbow eyes and pale hair. When Tanjiru looked at the upper moon two's hair from a different angle, his hair seemed to be a different color. From one angle he had blonde hair and from another he had pure white hair. Tanjiru didn't get to examine the upper moons for long though. Tanjiru lets go. You have to train. The next moment Nakaim had transported the two into Kokushibo's dojo. Muzen was obviously furious. Pantingu and Jayako were defeated only two months after Daki and Jutero. The embarrassing part was that Hantingu burned in the sun. He hadn't reached shade in time and burned. Pity, Jayako had been defeated by a kid. Embarrassing. But no matter. Soon after they died, Nakaim had found a way to figure out Yubayashiki's hiding place. Musen instructed the remaining upper moons to stay in the Infinity Castle until Nakaim would find Yubayashiki. This change in the routine bored Tanjiru. While the confusing nature of the Infinity Castle did distract the young demon enough to not be bored all the time during his free time, he also wanted to see the outside world. It had been a while since he and Kokushibo had went out and now he was stuck inside. Most of the time when he wasn't training, Tanjiru would jump around in the Infinity Fortress, seeing where he'll end up this time. Sometimes Nakai might decide to entertain Tanjiru a bit and move the castle even more than usual, creating a small obstacle course for Tanjiru. Still, Tanjiru wanted to go outside every once in a while. Sensei, Tanjiru spoke. Kokushibo turned his head towards Tanjiru, implying that he was listening. Why can't we go outside? He has ordered us to stay inside for now. Soon, everything will go back to normal. Tanjiru stayed quiet for a while, progressing Kokushibo's answer. Can we go outside then? To the forest? Kokushibo nodded and Tanjiru smiled. His smile wasn't bright or big, it was small and soft. The boy's eyes began shimmering slightly at the though of going outside. Maybe one day, the boy will be the bright kid he might have been. Another night or day, Tanjiru couldn't tell. Being trapped in the Infinity Castle sure was boring. But alas, Musen Sama had ordered them to stay. There has been a few things on Tanjiru's mind lately. He wonders about his past. Not that it mattered. It's just that Tanjiru knew how important Kokushibo was. There had to be a reason why he took Tanjiru. Tanjiru must have had a family and friends at some point. So at what point did Kokushibo arrive? Kokushibo Sensei. Tanjiru spoke up. Kokushibo stayed quiet, turning his head slightly towards Tanjiru to show that he was listening. Where did I come from? Who was I? Kokushibo was quiet for a moment. I do not know about your past family or friends, but you used to be a swordsman. There was a slight gleam of curiosity in Tanjiru's red eyes. Is there anything else you can tell me? 
Is there anything that matters? Probably not. Tanjiro eventually answers after thinking about the question. Why did his past matter? Kokushibo provided him with food and trained him. Kokushibo took care of him. Why did the past matter when everything was fine in the present? He was allowed to explore the Infinity Fortress freely. He had everything he needed. A place to stay. Someone to rely on. Someone to trust. Someone who took care of him. Everything was fine and the past is in the past. Why did the past Tanjiro matter? Maybe the past Tanjiro was a horrible person. Maybe he had a bad home life. Maybe he was an orphan. Maybe not. It didn't matter. His training mattered. He needed to get stronger or he'd be a disappointment and a waste of time. He needed to prove that Kokushiba wasn't wasting his time. Nakaim hummed quietly as she adjusted the grip on her biwa. Lately she has been quite busy trying to find Yubayashiki. It was stressful, but today she was allowed a break. And even better, Kokushibo was out running some errands and Nakaim was placed as Tanjiro's babysitter. The bright red-eyed boy was the only demon whose company Nakaim enjoyed. Soon the said demon jumped down next to her, holding what looked like a small bell. Kokushibo sensei gave this to me. Tanjiro said, motioning to the bell in his hands. Nakaim smiled softly as Tanjiro set the bell aside, taking some strands of Nakaim's black hair and began to braid it. Tanjiro seemed to enjoy playing with Nakaim's hair, although he didn't know why. It feels kinda familiar. Tanjiro had said, like I've done it before. As Tanjiro braided Nakaim's long hair he talked about his day. Or night, nobody could really tell. One thing Nakaim noted while watching over Tanjiro was that whenever Tanjiro was enjoying himself, his attitude changed slowly into more of a young child. He got amazed easily. Nakaim learned that after being too long in this childlike state Tanjiro would fall asleep. Whenever it happened Nakaim ended up humming, sometimes even singing, a quiet lullaby that sat buried deep in her memory. Nakaim's soft voice rang through the impi corridors as she slowly petted Tanjiro's red hair. Sleep now, sweet ones, you are safe tonight. In slumber you'll find your heart's delight. Forget all your troubles and sorrows so deep. Fade away from the world's harsh keep. Lullaby for the lost ones, a silent embrace. Rest in peace and a sweet solace. Lullaby for the lost ones, you are not alone. Dream of a brighter future to come. Tanjiro reminded Nakaim of her more unhappy times. The times when she was a human. The times when she had a husband. Her useless scumbag gambler husband. Tanjiro didn't remind Nakaim of her husband no no no. He reminded her of the time she though she could have a child of her own. The time she was expecting a child. The time she was waiting to bring another life into the world. Tanjiro reminded Nakaim of her unborn child. Those bright and curious eyes. That soft hair. Nakaim had, at one point, imagined holding her own child in a warm loving embrace while combing through the soft hair, humming a soft tune. She had imagined listening to her child tell her about the adventures they had went on. She had imagined lulling her child to sleep. While she never was able to care for her own child, she could still care for Tanjiro. Nakaim's husband was a good-for-nothing, never able to do anything correctly. The idiot had gambled away her only performance kimono. However, knowing that if he hadn't done that, Nakaim would have never started killing people and therefore would have never met Nuzan Sama, which meant she would have never become a demon and never met Tanjiro. Nakaim thanked her useless husband for being a waste of oxygen. The only good thing he had done was cause Nakaim to eventually meet Tanjiro. No one would be able to tell her otherwise. From this day on, Tanjiro would be her son. Whoever the fuck were his parents, tough luck, Tanjiro was now her son. Whoever the heck raised the ball of sunshine, yeah, thank you for raising him. But he's now Nakaim's child. Tanjiro's parents could bite the goddamn bloody dust. Tanjiro had been allowed to go outside once a month, while Nakaim and Muzan searched for Yubayashiki's hiding place. Tanjiro loved those nights when he was allowed to go outside and see the sky again. It also gave him a better understanding of how much time had passed. Tanjiro hopped quietly through the dark forests. His sensitive nose picked up all sorts of scents. The fresh and cold scent of the river nearby. The small and slightly aggressive scents the animals had left behind to mark their territory. Then a new scent appeared in the air. The smell of blood, though it wasn't human blood. No, it was simply blood from an injured animal. Oh, there the animal in question is. It was a small rabbit. It had a wound on its back. Hey, little guy. Tanjiro muttered softly. The rabbit was scared of Tanjiro's demonic presence, but couldn't run away. No need to worry, here. Tanjiro reached over and gently tied a cloth around the rabbit's wound. The rabbit couldn't move yet so Tanjiro took the opportunity to pet the rabbit's soft fur. Slowly as the minutes went by, the rabbit began to relax into Tanjiro's touch. It was still trembling out of fear, but could understand that Tanjiro, at least for now, didn't mean no harm. A few minutes or maybe even an hour later, the rabbit ran. 
the wound was healed enough for the small animal to move. Tanjiro stared into the trees, where the rabbit had run off to. He could feel Kokushibo's empty stare drilling into his back. Let's go. The sun is about to rise. Tanjiro nodded and jumped next to Kokushibo, and accompanied by a biwa sound, the duo was back at the Infinity Castle. The end was near, everyone could feel it. Who knows who will win? The end was near. Everyone could feel it. Nakaim was getting closer and closer to finding Yubai Eshiki. Everyone was starting to get stressed. Tanjiro, however, was the only one calm. Musen quite expected this. Despite slowly getting the bright shine of his back, he was still a mindless tool. If he was told to stay calm, he stayed. Dauma, being Dauma, had invited himself into Kokushibo's dojo. Kokushibo Danu Dauma stopped in the middle of his sentence. Kokushibo was sitting down with Tanjiro in front of him. Kokushibo was brushing Tanjiro's, now quite, long hair. There was a soft smile on Tanjiro's lips. The moment they heard Dauma, they turned to look at him. Tanjiro's smile vanished and the air around Kokushibo began to feel heavier. Oh, my apologies Kokushibo Dono. How many times do I have to remind you? Do not enter my dojo without my premission, Kokushibo said. It took Dauma a while to realize that Kokushibo had cut his head off. My, you're sure are quite fast Kokushibo Dono. Is Tanjiro-san as fast as you? Tanjiro tilted his head to the side. Kokushibo sensei, doesn't he have something better to do? Dauma chuckled. Oh don't worry your little head Tanjiro. I always have time for my friends. Tanjiro blinked in confusion. But, I'm not your friend. Dauma pretended to be shocked and hurt. Kokushibo sensei, are you his friend? Kokushibo shook his head. I am not his friend. Oh you two are just so mean. Dauma whined, putting his head back on his shoulders. Just like a Kazadono. After Kokushibo managed to get Dauma out of his dojo and back to his cult, Tanjiro's training continued. Tanjiro playfully swung his legs as he stared into the depths of the Infinity Castle. Musen Sama left an hour ago. He should be arriving back soon. Tanjiro pondered. Then he heard someone shout. It was Kokushibo. Tanjiro turned around to face his teacher. Tanjiro, the demon slayers, have been transported here. Come, here, Kokushibo said. Tanjiro followed the order and stood up. Now he was able to sense the groups of demon slayers running around. Tanjiro hopped towards the six-eyed demon and clung to his arm once he reached him. Kokushibo didn't seem to care enough to tell Tanjiro not to do that and ran back to his dojo, with Tanjiro hanging onto his arm. Be ready. For when the demon hunters arrive. Tanjiro nodded closed his eyes. When his vision darkened, his hearing sharpened and all of the scent became more clearer. He was able to draw a picture into his mind. A picture of a group of demon slayers running close to Kokushibo's dojo. However the group turned away on an intersection and ran away from the dojo. Tanjiro sat down and concentrated. His senses reached deeper into the fortress and he saw two Hashiras trying to attack Nakaim. It wasn't really going well. About a few minutes later someone crashed into the dojo. It was a young boy, probably younger than Tanjiro. Or maybe not, Tanjiro wasn't sure how old he was. The boy had long black hair that ended in cyan tips. His eyes were cyan as well. The uniform looked a bit too big on him. The uniform. In one of Tanjiro's earliest memories, Tanjiro had an uniform that looked almost identical to the boy's. A demon slayer uniform. Was he a demon slayer before? It didn't matter, did it? Kokushibo had told him all that mattered. If he was a demon slayer and it mattered, Kokushibo would have told him. Maybe he wasn't a very talented one. Kokushibo had probably greeted the demon slayer because he had raised his head. When he saw Tanjiro next to Kokushibo he seemed more shocked than when he had seen Kokushibo's rank. He looked like he knew Tanjiro. Did he? You. The boy muttered. You're that boy from the trial. Trial. So he knew Tanjiro. The what trial? Who are you exactly? Tanjiro asked. Do I know you? Don't pay attention to his words, Kokushibo said, laying a hand on Tanjiro's shoulder. He could be trying to distract you. Tanjiro moved his gaze from the demon slayer to his teacher. Why was Kokushibo's usually calm scent mixed with the scent of annoyance? Normally, even when Akaza and Dauma got into a fight for the tenth time in five minutes, Kokushibo's scent always stayed plain, calm, empty. But now there was annoyance. Why? Tanjiro shook it off and turned back to the demon slayer, but noticed that he wasn't there anymore. Tanjiro turned around and saw the demon slayer behind them. Had Kokushibo dodged his attack and dragged Tanjiro as well. The demon slayer, most likely a Hashira, attacked a few more times. After the third attack Tanjiro got bored and decided to let Kokushibo deal with him. Tanjiro heard Kokushibo talk something about the Hashira being his descendant and thinking about turning him into a demon. 
Tanjiro didn't really pay attention, since he was focusing on something else. A strangely familiar scent was mixed with the other scents. Where had Tanjiro smelled the scent before? It smelled like a wild boar. That's how Tanjiro could best describe it. The scent got closer and closer until a boy with a boar head jumped through the roof. The boy laughed quite weirdly and it also seemed like he didn't notice Tanjiro. Tanjiro jumped towards the boy and kicked him. It wasn't a lethal kick. It might cause damage to the human boy but wouldn't damage him beyond fighting. The boy crashed into the wall. The boy coughed, who the boy's loud voice faded into nothingness the moment he spotted Tanjiro. Manjiro. What? Majiro. Who was Manjiro? Was the boar boy referring to him? But his name was Tanjiro. Tanjiro tilted his head and blinked his four eyes in confusion. Are you talking to me? Tanjiro asked. When the boar boy arrived, he seemed full of energy. He seemed like he was ready to fight. But after seeing Tanjiro it seemed like he had no desire to fight. Like all of his energy was taken away the moment he spotted Tanjiro. Did he know him? Inasuk stared in shock as the friend he lost months ago stood before him, unknowing who he was. Tanjiro had changed drastically. He had four eyes and each eye had a blood red sclear and slitted cat-like pupils. His hair had grown and was in a ponytail, though the ponytail wasn't really long, barely reaching the back of his neck. Tanjiro's scar had extended over his nose and another one was placed under one of his extra eyes. Even though he was a completely different person, he was still recognizable. However, while Inasuke could easily remember who Tanjiro was, Tanjiro had no idea who Inasuke was. In moments the battlefield was filled with chaos. Genya, Sanmi and Jayomai had arrived and were all doing their best against the Upper Moon One, even with a little distraction going around trying to kill them. Inasuke had no other option but to fight. But could he bring Tanjiro down? Could he fulfill the promise he made to Tanjiro? Could he behead him? He couldn't. He already knew it. No matter what he did, he couldn't bring himself to slash at Tanjiro's neck. Not when Tanjiro had done so much good to him. Not when Tanjiro had been so kind to him. Inasuk, Muakairo, Sanmi and Genya stared. They stared, because the scene in front of them was something they'd never seen before. Tanjiro, the boy who carried his demon sister around, now being a demon himself, was frowning. The demon boy was hiding slightly behind the upper moon one. He clunged to the older demon, clenching the purple and black hexagonal patterned kimono the upper moon wore and leaning against him. All of his four eyes had narrowed to a childish glare. His mouth formed what looked like a pout. He honestly looked more like an adorable child than a bloodthirsty demon. Tanjiro moved closer to Kokushibo, hiding half of his face behind his arm. Tanjiro frowned. He could already from the scent alone tell that the demon slayer in front of them was on a whole new level, when compared to the previous ones. Tanjiro let out a quiet growl. Inasuke almost cried. His best friend, the one who had offered him food, the one who had trained with him, had just growled. He was a demon. Each one of his eyes were focusing on one person. The one on his forehead was staring at Genya and Muakairo, who were right next to each other. His left eye was glaring at Sami and his right eye was almost still, never leaving Jayomai. The eye on his cheek was staring right into Inasuke's soul. When Kokushibo heard Tanjiro growl, he laid his hand, that had been previously hiding Tanjiro, on Tanjiro's shoulder. Tanjiro, now being brought into a half-hug, buried his face in Kokushibo's kimono. It was almost father-like hold. If only Kokushibo wouldn't be a demon. Demons can't have family-like bonds. There was absolutely no way the upper moon one out of all demons would lay a fatherly hand on another demon's shoulder. If you'd ask Kokushibo if he cared about Tanjiro, he'd not answer. He'd stay quiet, because at this point, he doesn't know either. Tanjiro is just a demon he's teaching, so he shouldn't care about him. Yet, when the boy growled and tried to hide behind him, Kokushibo couldn't help but bring the boy into some kind of hug-like hold. God, is he going insane? Though he probably is already insane. The boar-headed demon slayer doesn't seem fond of Kokushibo's action. Even with the lifeless head covering his face, Kokushibo can still sense the anger. Let go of Manjiro. The boy yells and almost runs to Kokushibo, but is stopped by the wind Hashira. Are you an idiot? The Hashira yells. Is this? Boy perhaps. Tanjiro's old friend. Kokushibo thinks. Well, from the way he seems to react to anything that happens to Tanjiro, it seems yes. Kokushibo looks down at Tanjiro, to see if seeing his old friend reminded him of his human life. But Tanjiro is only glaring at the demon slayer, like an angry pitiful child. Maybe his sister would have reminded him, if she were still alive that is. But Kokushibo is no fool. He knows that even a demon who has lost their human memories long long time ago, can remember when seeing someone they were close to. And Tanjiro has only been a demon for about a year now. Why doesn't his friend remind him? 
The answer is simple, because Kokushibo is able to give something to Tanjiro that he has been wanting for years now. It's stupid, but it makes sense. Kokushibo heard that Tanjiro was around 13 years old when his family was slaughtered by Muzan and his sister turned into a demon. Even though he wasn't a little kid anymore, the trauma did a number on him. The way Kokushibo has been treating Tanjiro for the past month is almost family type of. The upper moon isn't so harsh on the boy during their training sessions, and even gives him compliments when the boy succeeds. Heck, he even helps Tanjiro do his hair. Ever since Tanjiro's family was killed, something inside of him made him cling to his sister, the last remaining bit of his family. But now when she was gone as well, Tanjiro had nobody. Nobody but his sensei, Kokushibo, who seemed to care for him. The small childish part inside Tanjiro's still developing brain yearns for a family-like relationship and who has been there for him the longest he can remember. Kokushibo, who has trained him so he'll get stronger. Kokushibo. To him, Kokushibo is the only one who hasn't abandoned him yet, and he clings to that tiny bit of hope, that once this night is over, everything will go back to normal. The stone Hashira prepares to attack, and Kokushibo can feel Tanjiro's hand tighten around the fabric of his kimono. Then he loosens completely. Don't die, sensei. Kokushibo can't help but comfortingly pat the boy's back. I won't, do not worry. Then Tanjiro retreats and takes his sword out. Even though he looks determined, if you look hard enough, you can see the amount of nervousness the boy is hiding. He hasn't been up against a real opponent yet. He's afraid. Afraid that he'll die. Afraid that Kokushibo will die. He glances at Kokushibo whose stare is blank as always, but Tanjiro somehow finds comfort in it. It'll be alright, Kokushibo sensei is strong. He reassures himself. He personally trained me and he believes that I am strong enough. Tanjiro takes a deep breath and attacks. As the fight went on, with Tanjiro fighting the boar-headed demon slayer and the mist Heshira, who is still very injured, Kokushibo finally made up his mind. Yes, he did in fact care about Tanjiro. Even though Tanjiro did look a lot like him, he still wasn't. Tanjiro was not Yoriichi. Yoriichi died long time ago. Tanjiro is a young boy under his care. As Kokushibo maybe imagined Tanjiro as Yoriichi to fill in the void in his cold heart. No, he doesn't think of Tanjiro as a reincarnated version of Yoriichi and never will. But somehow, Tanjiro still does fill in the void that Yoriichi left behind. As the mist Hashira slashes dangerously close to Tanjiro's neck, it's surprising how he's able to move at all. Kokushibo feels an emotion he hasn't felt in centuries. Anger. Kokushibo feels rage build up at the thought of Tanjiro dying, and he realizes how foolish he is. Anger is a human emotion. Tanjiro isn't related to him and just like Kokushibo, he's just another demon serving Muzan until they get beheaded. So there's no good reason for him to feel angry at that moment. Same goes for the moment where the mist Heshira, named Muakairo, talked about Tanjiro's past, his human life. The thought of Tanjiro regaining his human memories and hating Kokushibo is another thought that makes Kokushibo's blood boil. He's an idiot. He's getting weak. Anything remotely human in a demon makes them weak. Any type of relationship that has even a little bit of family like Bond weakens everyone. Just like Tanjiro's blood demon art, it makes the victim see a dead relative. It makes them vulnerable, an easy target. That's not true. Was that Kokushibo talking to himself or something else buried in his already messed up mind? Who knows? While human emotions makes demons weak, one human emotion can make them even more powerful. Fondness, the need and want to protect a loved one can make someone even stronger. Kokushibo has heard all of those cliché stories, where parents are granted supernatural powers when their child is in danger. In those moments the parent isn't thinking on any logic, just listening to the absolute need to save their kid. Get the kid from under the tree. Push them from the oncoming cart's way. Doesn't matter how or what you do just save them. He's heard them all. Inasuk dodged another attack from Tanjiro. The red-haired boy's face was filled with mixed emotions, fear, determination, slight tiredness and a bit of anger. He was afraid of him and Kokushibo dying. He was determined to win. He was tired this war. He was angry because of demon slayers his and Kokushibo's lives were at risk. Was it their fault that they had to eat humans in order to survive? Was it people's fault that they had to eat chicken, pork and other animals in order to survive? No, Muakairo slashed at Tanjiro's neck, but luckily missed. A scent of anger hits Tanjiro's nose. Kokushibo sensei is angry. Tanjiro thinks as he dodges Muakairo's sad attempt of an attack. Something bad happened. He's never angry. Tanjiro jumps back a bit to avoid Inasuke's sloppy attack. The boy didn't even try to kill him. 
He's an easy target already. Tanjiro thought. Could be easier. Tanjiro closed three of his eyes and took a deep breath. When he exhaled and opened his eyes, only he could see the dark fog starting to surround Inosuke. It hadn't been long after Yushiro had brought everyone from the collapsing Infinity Castle into the surface, when he had encountered a strange sight. Even now, 15 minutes later, he still couldn't stop glancing back at the two demons. He easily recognized the smaller one. It was Tanjiro. If his slightly different appearance didn't give it away then his earrings most certainly did. The other one was what made Yushiro cautious. The upper one kanji in the demon's eyes made Yushiro constantly glance over. Chachamaru didn't see anything wrong with the duo. He was happily receiving pets from Tanjiro while laying on the boy's lap. The cat purred happily as Tanjiro scratched under his chin. The upper moon glanced towards Yushiro. Are you going to treat them? He asked, referring to the injured demon slayers next to them. Yushiro was got off guard by this question. The upper moon one was asking if a grab of demon slayers were going to be treated. Yes of course, but why are you here, asking me if I will treat your enemies instead of being out there, fighting against us to help your master? Yushiro spat. The upper moon blinked. I suppose, you would not, believe me, if I told you the reason. Well, he's correct. He's the upper moon one, why should he trust him? Yushiro glared at him before turning towards Tanjiro. And what the hell happened to you? Tanjiro turned his gaze from Chachamaru to Yushiro. Then he tilted his head, as if not understanding Yushiro's question. Did you lose brain cells after turning into a demon? Tanjiro blinked in confusion. Have I seen you before? Before Yushiro could get angry and shout at Tanjiro the upper moon spoke. He has lost his memories. Of course I knew that. Yushiro glared before crouching down next to the injured demon slayers. Seriously, what the hell happened to Tanjiro over the past year? It hadn't been long after Yushiro had brought everyone from the collapsing Infinity Castle into the surface when he had encountered a strange sight. Even now, 15 minutes later, he still couldn't stop glancing back at the two demons. He easily recognized the smaller one. It was Tanjiro. If his slightly different appearance didn't give it away then his earrings most certainly did. The other one was what made Yushiro cautious. The upper one kanji in the demon's eyes made Yushiro constantly glance over. Chachamaru didn't see anything wrong with the duo. He was happily receiving pets from Tanjiro while laying on the boy's lap. The cat purred happily as Tanjiro scratched under his chin. The upper moon glanced towards Yushiro. Are you going to treat them? He asked, referring to the injured demon slayers next to them. Yushiro was got off guard by this question. The upper moon one was asking if a grab of demon slayers were going to be treated. Yes of course, but why are you here, asking me if I will treat your enemies instead of being out there, fighting against us to help your master? Yushiro spat. The upper moon blinked. I suppose, you would not, believe me, if I told you the reason. Well, he's correct. He's the upper moon one, why should he trust him? Yushiro glared at him before turning towards Tanjiro. And what the hell happened to you? Tanjiro turned his gaze from Chachamaru to Yushiro. Then he tilted his head, as if not understanding Yushiro's question. Did you lose brain cells after turning into a demon? Tanjiro blinked in confusion. Have I seen you before? Before Yushiro could get angry and shout at Tanjiro the upper moon spoke. He has lost his memories. Of course I knew that. Yushiro glared before crouching down next to the injured demon slayers. Seriously, what the hell happened to Tanjiro over the past year? Kokushibo took a deep breath. Tanjiro, HM. Tanjiro turned his head slightly upwards to look at Kokushibo. If during any time of this fight your life will be placed in danger, I want you to run, huh? Tanjiro tilted his head. Why, if the sun is about to rise or something else threatens your life, you will have to run. Tanjiro opens his mouth to demand an explanation but changes his mind. What about you? Kokushibo stays silent for a moment before answering. I cannot guarantee that. I will survive, but I will try my hardest. Tanjiro nods stiffly. Just as Kokushibo is about to dash into the battlefield, he grabs onto his kimono sleeve. You promise that you wouldn't die. He says, I know. Kokushibo replies, you'll promise to try and keep that promise. Tanjiro asks after a while. Kokushibo reaches his hand out towards the boy and pats his head. I promise. Tanjiro lets go of Kokushibo's sleeve. Kokushibo then pulls the young demon into an actual hug. Promise me that whatever happens, you'll think of your own life, not mine, not those demon slayers. Tanjiro returns the hug with unsure arms. I promise. Kokushibo pets his soft hair again. Good. Then he lets go. Good luck. Tanjiro nods and watches Kokushibo run into the battle. Then after a minute or two, he takes his own sword out. 
when Kokushibo had instructed him to attack Muzan, Tanjiro had been a bit confused. For as long as Tanjiro can remember, Kokushibo has repeatedly told him to never disrespect Muzan, and attacking him was the most disrespectful thing Tanjiro could ever imagine. But just the thought of using his skills against the Demon King made something inside Tanjiro burn. Anger, the thought of burying the blade of his katana into the Demon Lord's flesh made Tanjiro's blood boil. He wanted nothing more than to watch the demon burn under the sun. But why? Why would he want that? Why would Kokushibo want that? Tanjiro shoved those questions into the depths of his mind and attacked. Upon spotting Kokushibo and Tanjiro, Muzan let out a furious roar. You traitors, was all Muzan could muster. He was seeing red. His most loyal subordinate hadn't died in battle like he had originally thought when he suddenly couldn't see through Kokushibo's eyes or hear his thoughts. No, he had betrayed him. Join the Demon Slayers. This fight is only the beginning. Did Kokushibo change sides like Muzan accused him? Technically speaking, no. Only temporarily. But right now he knows that if he went Muzan gone, he needs to team up with his enemies. They all want one thing. So Kokushibo tolerates them. He tolerates the idea of working with the Demon Slayers only this once. Does he think he'll survive? No. If he does survive he'll be shocked. But that doesn't matter right now. What matters is bringing Muzan down. Out of the corner of two of his eyes, Kokushibo can see Tanjiro sprint out into the battlefield and launch an attack against Muzan. Tanjiro, the yellow-haired demon slayer cries out. Do you remember us? Tanjiro quickly glances at the boy. Not really. He answers. But you do seem slightly familiar. The demon slayer cries. He actually cries. Waira. Tanjiro, I've missed you. The boy dodges Muzan's attack. Kraa. One hour until sunrise. A crow nearby screams. One hour. Kokushibo echoes we'll only need to keep him here for one hour. Kokushibo grabs a hold of Tanjiro's Hayori and pulls him out of range of one of Muzan's attacks. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through what if Tanjiro was Upper Moon's apprentice. Found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout out to SM0LB3TCH for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on Wattpad for more amazing works. The link is in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to Quirky What If for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.